Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Excel Dialogues here from the garage at the Excel World Academy in Singapore. We're so happy to have all of you with us today. We know that many of you are here in the room. We've got people watching uh, in the school, in classes, and we have lots of friends at other institutions watching us around the region, and other friends who are non-education folks watching the stream as well. We're very happy to have you with us. I'm Glenn Van Zutphen. I'm the founder of Van Media Group and also the host of of Saturday mornings on Money FM 89.3 radio station here in Singapore. Uh, very happy to have with us Ambassador Kirk Wagger, the president of Wagger Global. Many of you who are in Singapore or travel through Singapore know Kirk, and it is his first time back in a couple of years, right, since the pandemic? Absolutely. I left here on March 10th, thinking I'd be back in a couple of months, and then the world shut down, and it's been two years. So I'm very happy to be t back in my second home. So thanks I, for I was going to say, this is very much home to you and your wife, Crystal, is it not? Absolutely. I had uh, both my children when I was here in the, uh, in the job here, and uh, I now have my older daughter, Reese, is eight, and my younger daughter is five. Um, my, uh, my older daughter, Reese, remembers it fondly. She was a little more than three when we left. She says, Mommy's from Iowa, Daddy's from Canada, Avery is from Miami, but I'm from Singapore. So she's very proud to be Singaporean. So your kids are third culture kids, like many of our students here, and uh, you're a third culture dad as well, and, uh, and, uh, and all the different things that you've done. Before we, we have a lot to talk about today, I, I would like to start with Excel World Academy, though. You're on the, on the board here, yeah. the board of directors. First of all, what does that mean? What do you do on the board? And tell us a little bit about how you perceive Excel World Academy and Excel education. Sure. Um, thank you for that. Um, my mother was a uh, elementary school teacher for 40 years, um, but back when she graduated high school, she didn't go to she didn't go to university. She only went through two years of teachers' college, and that she went through and worked her way through internships to become a fully licensed teacher. I'm the first person in my entire family, and I'm talking first cousins or otherwise, to graduate university, let alone law school, and. Um, since that time, I've been in a lot of rooms with people with really impressive degrees, um, but they haven't had the hustle of the street smarts that maybe uh, I had to rely on to get us there. And so when Brian Rogoff, who is the CEO of XL, uh, approached me and said, would you like to have a voice on what we're trying to create here, I jumped at the chance, because I don't think there's anything more important than education. Um, so what I think that he's tried to build, and on the board we try and support that and maybe give suggestions here and there, but really support that vision. And with people, you know, if you're going to get a new head of school, the board gets asked a question and have an opinion. And then things like the garage, uh, which cost, uh, costs some money that some other schools don't have, we, we say that's a great idea because we want to be different. And I think that's what this academy is to me. It's got a different mentality, it's got a different student body, it's got a different teaching core, uh, and it's about really teaching the whole person, not just reading, writing, and, and arithmetic as maybe the old school uh, way of doing business. It's interesting you say that, it, it, uh, a new way of looking at things, and those of our friends who are in the room and the students here know about this place we're in right now called the garage, but if you have never been here before, what's directly behind this partition is the eSports Stadium that was purpose-built here, uh, the first one in Singapore at an international school or any school, and uh, it, it, I think, signifies not just the love that students have for gaming, but the understanding that this is a 20-something billion dollar business uh, at the moment and only going up and to be able to teach students about more than just the standard subjects, in addition to the standard subjects, subjects of the future. So, you know, I think that as you become a parent, and you all will get there, and I hope you give some, uh, give your parent a break, because we all see things through our lens, right? So sports is one of the things that made me different or gave me confidence in school. My son, who's 16, is a phenomenal drummer. And when I say phenomenal, um, he's actually playing in Europe this summer at a couple of music festivals, which blows my mind at 16. Wow, cool. um, but when he was like six and seven and eight, I was like, come on, try basketball. And he's awful. I mean, 
terrible. And I was like, come on, try soccer. Nope, awful. Um, but he found his way. Uh, my daughter, who's eight, who is less like an eight-year-old and more like a game show host, I, I don't know what she's going to do, but she loves fashion, she loves cooking. And the reason I'm saying that is there's so many different things out there, so many different paths to success, but really more importantly to happiness, that a school should focus on pushing a child, and frankly, even the teachers and parents, to the place where they can excel, because you'll be happiest there. So that's one of the reasons I, I think that this laboratory, not just this room, but the school as a laboratory for finding what y'all are good at and helping you succeed in that, and maybe opening your eyes to certain things in what you're good at. You know, if you're, if you're good at drama, maybe you could be a really good lawyer or actress or writer or whatever, but there's a lot of different paths. And when you look at the, this, the, the eSports, yeah, this is an incredible opportunity to see where the world is going with Web3 and the metaverse and all those things, which people my age and his age have no clue how to use, let alone build. But the people in this room have the tools already. So that's what this school is to me. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, that we look at the world of NFTs now. We look at the world of cryptocurrency, crypto trading, and things, um, an entire new industry has cropped up in the last five or six years uh, that is all part of you students' life now and will be for the rest of your lives, and something that is just so completely unknown to so many people. And, and I think this idea of trying new things and being exposed to new things, um, when, when you talk to the students, students here, the students online that are watching us, you have tried a lot of things in your life. <laughs> And, and I have known you for many years now, thankfully, and one of the things I know about you is that you nearly, uh, to my knowledge, have never said no to anything, uh, or almost anything. Uh, but, but that is part of, I think, a growth mindset that I hope, personally, students will adopt, which is try everything you can, even though it may hurt a little bit. Do it safely, whatever it is. Don't do anything that's going to hurt yourself. But wh how do you feel about that, that growth mindset, that just say yes kind of uh, um, attitude toward life? I, I think that's important, but I, I think that knowing who you are is the first step of that, right? And so after I left this job as ambassador, I was a lawyer for 21 years. I was pretty good at it, um, but I didn't want to do that anymore. Right? I had this opportunity to be U.S. ambassador. I was born in rural Canada, so here I am, an American ambassador, but I, I have both a Canadian and American uh, passport. So I like to say that I was uh, an immigrant representing the country of immigrants, uh, which I do think is America's special sauce. Um, but after the job here, which was the most humbling and incredible experience of my life, it was like, okay, now what? And, but I knew what I was good at and I knew what I wasn't good at. And so when I talk to, you know, lots of people will come at me and they, they see a former US ambassador and you know, I, I know Singapore very well. We were all around. They would, they would, people would come at me and say, we want you to join our organization. And I'd say, what do you want me to do? And they'd say, we'll, we'll figure that, that out later. That's a trap. 100% of the time, that's a trap. Because if they don't know how to use you, then how can you be successful? So as you're trying things, try things that you think that you can add value to. Um, and sometimes it's just a, 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 a different perspective. Glenn was talking about uh, crypto and blockchain. So the thing I'm doing most right now is I work with the largest crypto exchange in the world. It's called Binance.com. And Binance is incredible, but it's been around for five years. That's it. But they never had anyone who had been in government. They had no one who had any corporate background. They're all just brilliant tech guys. So when I say things that I think are pretty mundane or simple, it sounds like I've just cured cancer when I say, well, you should probably think of it this way. This, uh, so I knew I could offer them something because they're 10 times smarter than me on everything that matters, but they don't have my experience with dealing with government or dealing with business or dealing with some of the, the things that we take for granted. So it, it's exciting. It's probably the coolest thing I've ever done because I'm around all these brilliant people in a space that I'm learning about. Uh, and I think that both of us, and I hope you all will be lifelong learners. Right? I hope that you're learning stuff till you know, you're done, because that's what makes life wor worthwhile. 
whether it's finding new music, trying new foods, or jumping out there and trying a new industry. You know, in the last five years, I helped. The reason why there's Teslas in Singapore is because I helped Tesla on their market entry with being able to bring stuff in. I, I dealt with Singapore government, which is um, challenging. Uh, but they know me. Uh, they wanted Tesla, so that's what I did. I just, you know, I said, okay, talk to this person. You talk to that person. How do we get to yes? I have no special skill, but I know uh, being truthful uh, and hardworking gets you a lot of the way. Well, I think you're being pretty modest by saying you don't have any special skills, but because certainly being a lawyer uh, and having that mindset as well and that education would have surely helped with some of these business deals. Let, let me tell you on. something. Uh, it, what, anybody who ever goes to law, here, law school here when you're older, you'll realize that there's a few people there, but most people are just like going on that next step, that next step, that next step. There's not people who love what they do, like you love how, how, what you do. Or, um, you know, like doctors love what they do. Not a lot of lawyers love what they do. I mean, it's just not happening. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's talk about your time as ambassador. So you were here from 2013 to uh, 20, January 2017, um, appointed by President Obama, and, uh, and really ushered in a, um, a, a very interesting time in Singapore's history, but also in American history as well, uh, being the U.S. ambassador. First of all, break down for us how you become a U.S. ambassador. <laughs> what is that process look like uh, in case somebody out there is thinking, hmm, that sounds like an interesting job? Uh, Y'all might be too young to know the movie Forrest Gump, but Forrest Gump, the Forrest Gump movie is he just shows up everywhere. Like he's in all these different circumstances just by happenstance. I am a modern day Forrest Gump. I just kind of <laughs> happen to be in different places and it just happens. So I always get the question when I talk to students, how do you become a U.S. ambassador? And I tell everyone who asks me that question, that's the wrong question to ask. The question is, how do, you get, how do you end up being involved in things that as you sit here right now, you can't imagine having that opportunity? And, that, and that's very simple. Get involved in things bigger than yourself. Whatever that passion is, if it's the environment, if it's animals, if it's cancer research, if it's a Kiwanis club, get involved in something that's bigger than yourself. And for me, that was politics. For me, I... Uh, came to the United States when I was 18 years old. I went to college there. I went to law school there. Um, but I got involved because as an immigrant to the United States, I just loved being in the mix. Canada is a great country. I'm glad I'm from there. I'm glad my mom's there. But every relevant conversation in the world, both good and bad, the United States has a seat at the table. And that's what I wanted. So I started knocking on doors and picking up people from the airport and stuffing envelopes. Um, and end of it, end, ended up working my way up uh, through campaigns to, you know, becoming the, the head guy in Florida for Barack Obama. And he's the first Democrat to win Florida, which is kind of an important state, twice. He's the first one to win Florida twice since Franklin Delano Roosevelt, whose last election was 1946. So well, that's a long time. So because of that, I got to meet all these fascinating people. I ended up going to birthday parties at the White House. I'd never been in the White House in my life, not even on a tour before Barack Obama won. And then I, then I found myself there on the night that he was inaugurated, the first night that he and Michelle walked in there. I, I, was, I was like, this has got to be a mistake. I'm so what gonna... was that like? What, what was it like to be in the White House? It was bizarre. I mean, I just, I just felt at every moment someone's going to tap me on the shoulder and go, uh, Wagger, this is a complete mistake. You need to leave. Um, <laughs> But that was incredible. There was about 30 of us there. I mean, I was dating my now wife. Oprah Winfrey walks by and goes, girl, that's a beautiful dress. I was like, I was great. I was cool for like six months. I didn't have to buy her like shoes or a bag or nothing. Like she was like, you took me and Oprah Winfrey like my dress. But we ended up like going to wild stuff where we'd be at the president's birthday party or state dinner. But once I got here in this job, my friendships with the people that were in the White House allowed me to really push for things for Singapore. So when I, was in the, when I was the ambassador here, for example, Singapore had a state dinner. It was the first one they had had in 31 years. And what's a state dinner? What I does that mean? I was about to say. So it's a series of meetings 
during the day where they sign treaties, they do all kinds of things, educational exchanges, all of those things, and then at the end of the visit, they have a huge dinner in the White House. And Barack Obama did 14 of them. Singapore was the second to last one that he did. And again, it was the first one in 31 years, and the first one where the Prime Minister's name was not Lee Kuan Yew. And uh, so DC really got to learn about the relationship and how important Singapore was to America and this region. Um, I think Singaporeans had a great uh, sense of pride when they saw all the news coverage of Singaporean flags all through Washington, D.C., um, the huge arrival ceremony on the lawn of the White House with not just the President and the First Lady and, and Prime Minister Lee and, and, and his wife, but also all members of the Cabinet. You know, so it was, it was pretty cool. Um, but that only happened because, number one, I was a pest, but number two, <laughs> I, I had a relationship with people who I'd been on campaigns with. And by the way, everyone sees the Barack Obama campaign because we won, but I lost a bunch before that. And I can tell you, you make better friends losing campaigns than even when you win because you're going through some tough stuff together. So, but just get involved in stuff bigger than yourself. You know, just take a moment to talk about that since you've just mentioned it, because when we're all in school, we all think about got to win, got to do, have great grades, got to, you know, be at the top of the class. But a lot of learning comes when you don't succeed, when you fail at something. And failure is not necess failure is not a bad thing in any way, shape or form, if you can learn some lessons from it. Tell me about your, your feelings about, you know, maybe some of the campaigns you worked on that didn't work out or things that you failed at but then you grew from. I, I will address that, but it, it, that prompted something else about doing hard stuff, but I'll, I will get to that in a second. But when I look at some of the conversations we have, whether it be on faith or policy or politics, and I see someone who's on the other side of a table and they vehemently disagree with my point of view, and I mean on tough issues, you know, whether it's like gay marriage or abortion or things like that. I look at it as a personal failure if I can't move them to at least be open-minded. I, I think it's arrogant to think that I can convince them of how I see it. Like capital punishment is something I'm vehemently opposed to. It's just, I, I personally always have been. I would rather try and fail than not try, right? And so when you look at a political campaign or even a campaign for climate or whatever, your job is never going to be to win every battle. It's to win the war. And sometimes that war will be won after you leave, after you've moved on to something else. So I don't really see failures. I, I see, so I went to a Christian college undergraduate. And so I have some fairly liberal points of view. And for three years, I argued my points of view. And when I left that college, and that was, and when I say it was a conservative college, there was no drinking, no dancing, no swearing, chapel three times a week. It's, my wife says it sounds like Footloose. I'm not sure you know what that movie is either, but it's that kind of thing. But two things happened to me. Number one, my reasoning and ability to have a conversation instead of an argument improved immensely over three years. And number two, I changed my opinion on some things. Some things that I went in there as 18 year old, I was so darn sure of, maybe someone was smarter than me. And, and I listened. Um, and I look at political campaigns the same way. Um, fought hard, uh, made some lifelong friends. And those friends, you know, one of the things I say about the Barack Obama campaign is all the lessons I learned the hard way in the campaigns before that put me in exactly the right position to be there for this historic moment. How do we, de how do we deal with disappointment? How do we deal with, the, with the, that moment that you don't do well on your test or that moment that, you know, uh, your friends say something mean to you or whatever? How do you deal with that moment? Listen, here, here, here's, the, here's the one line in life. Everyone gets knocked down. It's whether you get back up, right? And I'm a rugby player from rural Canada. My dad left high school in ninth grade to go work on the boats. He ended up becoming a ship's captain in the Arctic. 
I was never the strongest, I'm never the fastest, never the best. But I can tell you this, I'll get up one more time than the other guy. And that's all you gotta do, you just get up one more time. When I was studying for the bar, um, I had about 20% failure rate. And I was nervous as hell. Nobody in my family had done anything like this. So to make myself feel better, when I was studying for it, if there's 20% uh, fail rate, I would try and find 100 people and I would say, there's 20, I, I want to find 20 people that I know I'm smarter than. I just go around, I know I'm working harder than that guy, I know I'm smarter than that, that person for sure. <laughs> None of it was true, but it made me feel better. <laughs> and you know, these are the, these are the tricks you got to do, right? When I first started practicing law, I was scared out of my mind to go into a, to, to, uh, a hearing. But the nice thing in Florida was, you line up and so other people go. So I got there and I was like scared at my first time there. Then I watch other people and I was like, well, dang it, I'm better than that dude. Oh, she's awful. And you know, you just, as Joe Biden says, don't judge me against the Almighty, judge me against the other guy. And I'm, you know, and I think we'll all, we'll all do pretty well under that scenario. Tell us about a typical day in your, oh, I know there's no typical, but tell us about a day in your life as ambassador. What do ambassadors do over the course of the four years that you're in the country? I know you're here to, you know, be the guy for Americans, but more than that, you're here to represent America to Singapore. So tell us about your day, what that would look like. Well, there, I mean, I, I never like to weasel questions, but you know, every day is different, but there's a theme to all of it. And, and I will um, correct you on one thing. My job was not to be here for Americans at all, not in my job description. My job was to be here for, uh, for Singaporeans and the American mission in the region, right? Um, it was a great thing to be able to be uh, involved in the American community here, and uh, thankfully we have such a great one here that it didn't take much of a lift, and you guys had great parties, and we got to go to them. <laughs> but um, so my embassy and the embassy here in Singapore is the second most requested in the world by our diplomats. So the people that work in that building over in Napier Road, um, most of them have had to work in Iraq or Afghanistan or Pakistan or like a hard country to get here because this is such a great place to live, number one. Number two, um, there's only three or four places around the world um, that have the appropriate health care. So if your kid's got asthma, you can't send them to Beijing or Delhi. Um, so this is a place for those type of families. And then 40% of the embassy has regional responsibilities, so they're doing cool stuff all over. So when I tell you that I was the least qualified person in the building every day, not a joke. But because I had all these pictures of me and Obama and Secretary of State John Kerry, I could get any meeting in the world. And then this is something I think is important. The two most, the two, two most important characteristics that you all can have is confidence and humility. I tell my son that if you put on a spectrum, I said, you know, when I came to this job, I knew this much. Now I know this much. So my ego right in here is massive. Like if you're in there, I'm going to tell you, I think. But I don't know anything over here or over here, right? And so I used to tell my staff at the embassy, whether we're talking about a port issue or trade or a military issue, listen, man, this is what you've been doing for 20 years. I've been in this job, you know, eight months at the time. I can get any meeting you want. You just prepare me and I'll say whatever. But I said, and here's the key. If I'm in a meeting, whether it's the prime minister or minister of defense, and I say something that's not right, correct me on the spot. Telling me back in the car on the way back to the embassy doesn't do me any favors, doesn't do America any favors. And I said, my ego's fine. I don't need to be an expert on some energy policy. No one expects that. What I am expected to be is a leader and to find the best person in the room to have this conversation about a topic. And in this world, 90% of the time, that's not gonna be Kirk Wagger. And, and so that's, that's what I think is important, that you have to have humility of knowing what you don't know. If you can get to that point, you will be in a small minority of people. When you look at this region, uh, not just Singapore, but Southeast Asia and the greater ASEAN region, what what do you think about the opportunities here? I know you were very strong on it when you lived here and worked here, 
uh, and you continue to be, but, but where do you see the big opportunities for this part of the world? Well, that's getting back to the thing that jogged my mind that I forgot to, forgot to say. I happen to believe that the global economy is going to be driven by South and Southeast Asia for the next 25 years, 100% of the time. How many here, how many people in the room here are Singaporean? Okay, we got a few. Mm -hmm. We got a few. So if I had one shocking thing to happen to me when I got here, it was finding out how few Singaporeans were willing to move to Bangkok, Jakarta, Ho Chi Minh, or KL for work. They'll move to London. They'll move to San Francisco. They'll move to New York. But if, as I believe, this region is going to be important, then you gotta, you gotta get your hands dirty. You gotta learn about how the different cultures in this region work and think. And if you do that, if you're, the most, if you're in the most dynamic region, you have an unfair advantage over someone coming from London or even Japan or certainly France because you understand the different cultures, right? One of the reasons I think America has an unfair advantage right now in a global economy is because we have so many people from around the world, immigrants like me. Right? And so it doesn't matter if we're doing business in Poland or Colombia or Vietnam, chances are there's someone who understands that culture, has a familiar relationship there. It gives us an unfair advantage. You all, by living and, and, and learning and soon to be working in this region, also have that unfair advantage. And I think you should take full opportunity of it. Um, there's just so many opportunities out here, but if you're going to move your way up, then you've got to know the difference between tai how Taiwan thinks and India thinks, because they're both going to be relevant. And, and you have that ability. And I think that uh, this is a pretty good start. I'd like to take this time for anybody in the, in the room. Anybody have a question for Ambassador Wagger? Um, crypto is obviously very modern and uh, only the last five years or so, as you say. Um, what's your view being so close to it? What's your view? on the future of crypto. It's had a, a roller coaster ride of nothing for a period of time, skyrocket, um, and then a bumpy ride from there. What's, what's the inside goss? Well, you know, I think that's a great question, Tony. And I, the answer is I don't think we know yet. Um, I think we know the technology of blockchain is transformational. Um, you know, in the US right now, the numbers are between 15 and 20% of the entire population has some exposure to cryptocurrency of some kind, which is a shockingly high number to me. Um, but it's really, my role in it is, if, as I think it is, the most dynamic asset class to come into existence in the last 100 years, however, it came into existence under the, the assumption that its value was because it could go around government. Well, those of us who have been in government knew that wasn't going to happen very, for very long. So now part of my role is to make sure that Binance particularly does all the things they need to do to be compliant with governments as this technology now involves, evolves. So there's certain things that are already going. NFTs, I mean, like, like art, some of it's good, some of it's bad, but the marketplace will set its, uh, set its own market. But gaming and things like that, creating your own content and getting paid for on, on Web3, that's something that these, that these young folks will, will actually be part of. What we don't know yet is what does mass adoption look like? So you know, this is far too boring for the people in the room, but more for Yumi and, and Glenn. But like, when you get to the point where you can get car insurance, with cryptocurrency, then who knows where it's going to go? Because it will be more secure and it will be cheaper. You know, uh, if you do blockchain uh, on credit cards, what now costs two and a half percent to use a Mastercard or four or five percent on, on an Amex goes through the go, goes away. And as I look at Ukraine right now, for example, if you're able to get aid to people that need it, whether they be in Africa or Myanmar or Ukraine, and bypass the corruption that we know exists, then society is better as a whole. So that, that's, that's where I'm at. In. Could I just uh, have a follow-on question? Um, sure. I don't want to get into the politics of the Ukraine, uh, what's happening up there at the moment. 
But um, obviously the, the, the Russian uh, situation is they've had their international finance disrupted through the uh, elimination of the SWIFT uh, platform. Um, do, have you heard anything at all about a major switch towards crypto um, as a result of that from Russia, trying to get their money out and, and to pay bills? No. Uh, the answer is um, there's, there's lots of um, commentary on that over the last week, as you can imagine. And the reality is um, just as you can't evade sanctions with an Amex, you can't do it with a crypto account either. I mean, uh, if you're sanctioned, you're sanctioned. At the same point, um, all the crypto exchanges that I've seen have the same view that um, cutting, up, cutting off access from people who legitimately aren't supporting this action by Russia, and it is outside of their ability to get, uh, the government that is, uh, would be the wrong thing to do philosophically and logically. Other questions? Uh, any questions from the students? Anybody? Yeah. Can we have the microphone up here, please? Did you choose to like get posted to Singapore? Or did you like, uh, or were you like assigned there? And why ambassador specifically? Why didn't you just like stay in the states or like become a senator or something? Well, senator's elected, and um, I doubt that I could be elected for anything, frankly, to be honest with you. Uh, although friends of mine uh, were pretty shocked that I got confirmed by the Senate for this job as well. Um, but I, I was a model UN kid, right? And um, I always wanted to be involved in things that I hadn't been involved in before, right? So when I was your age, uh, I was protesting apartheid at the South African Embassy in Ottawa. Um, and so I always wanted to be involved in something like that. So the international stuff was really exciting to me. And you can't really tell the President of the United States where, where uh, you'll go or not go. However, I, I did put some parameters on where I was willing to go. And so what I, what I, what I told President Obama was um, I didn't want to go to Europe because I didn't understand what a bilateral ambassador did in the context of the EU and NATO. Um, I didn't want to go to like the Bahamas or Belize because at the time I was 43 years old. I don't golf. I had a pretty good life in Miami. Uh, I, needed, I wanted to go someplace that was important for him, but more importantly, important for the future of our country. And so he gave us a couple of options, my wife and I, and we, we, said, we said that one wasn't really for us, and we said we'd go to a couple of different places. Um, and uh, he's, he thought this was the right fit for us, and I feel really, really lucky. Um, that he did. I was really lucky because I was the only political appointee in all of Southeast Asia. So all the other ambassadors in Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, <clears throat> they're all career diplomats. Phenomenal, um, incredibly educated, incredible, a lot of experience, but when you're a political appointee, you get the job because you're close to the president, which means there's nobody who can fire you except for the president. So my staff, for example, I would tell them, I said, listen, if you convince me it's a good idea, then we're gonna do it. And if someone's gotta take the heat, I'm done in another year and a half anyway, so whatever, if, if it's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to do. Um, I'll give you an example of that. So, <clears throat> um, June is considered the LGBT month for the State Department. And embassies all around the world flew the LGBT flag. Well, the LGBT community here in Singapore came to me and asked us not to do it. They said they didn't want it to look like it was a Western influence thing. So we're doing our own thing, we have our own thing. We love it that you have you invite us to parties and all that, but don't get in our business. So I said, no, we're not gonna do it. Well, there's some people in Washington, D.C. who just said, you got to. And I was like, um, not happening. So then they elevated to this boss and this boss. I said, I don't think you understand. I get to decide. Now, Barack Obama wants to call me on it. It's fine. Finally got to someone who understood and said, okay. <clears throat> but my staff was just getting beaten by like people who supposedly were their bosses, but I was their boss. But they, and you know, it was the right thing to do. 
I, was, I wasn't here to make a statement for me. I was here to, to achieve an objective. And my objective was to make sure that uh, the U.S. was doing what they needed to do and not doing what they didn't need to do. I'll give you one other example. So I get here, and I'm supposed to give this speech on ASEAN. I think this is funny. Maybe you think it's a, but so I get this speech, and the official position of the State Department was Myanmar was still Burma, right? So I get this speech first draft, and I'm and I was like, and I looked at my speechwriter, and I was like, listen, dude, nobody here calls it Burma. We sound like an imperial power. Like I have a pith helmet on, and I'm like, I'm not doing it. And okay, all right. So I'm, get, I'm preparing the speech the next couple days because I, I always got a first draft and then I wrote the rest of it. <laughs> and then this, this guy comes in like the next day and goes, good news, Ambassador. I called the State Department and they said it's okay for you to you say Myanmar. I was like, you don't understand. I wasn't asking. And nobody in this embassy is going to refer to it as Burma. And if someone wants to complain about it, here's my cell phone number, all of that. But we sound like jerks. Uh, and like that was just stuff you could do when you're an ambassador, a political ambassador. If it was a career ambassador, you're worried about getting your next job. I wasn't, but it was the right thing to do. Like neither of these two things, like it's not like I'm curing cancer here, right? It's like, okay, the local LGBT community says don't do it. Okay, how hard is that? But then you have these pinheads, you know, back in Washington sitting in a windowless room thinking they're really important and they're gonna, I'm like, I'm the wrong cat. <laughs> You're not, that's not gonna, that's not how I roll. Other questions from the audience here? Anybody have anything? Sure, thank you. First of all, thanks for the lovely talk. It's been very inspiring. Um, considering most of our young people here are going to be graduating in the next year or so, uh -huh, we hope, <laughs> um, I wonder if you could figure out uh, some advice to give them and how you deal with pressure or stress. Because I, I don't know about you, but I feel like today's generation faces a lot more than we did. Yeah, I mean, I, I so if it changes anyone's, I, I had, uh, I, again, I told you I graduated college a year early, so I was only in there for three years. I had six majors. Six. <laughs> six. Didn't matter. Didn't matter. Although the sociology one was a little shady. I shouldn't have done that <laughs> one. But, like, there is no wrong place for you to go as long as you're furthering your education. So, in the United States, for example, um, especially here in this region, everyone looks at the MITs or Harvards, all that. I would never send my children there, 100% of the time. Never, ever, ever. There is a book, and I think there's a website now that's called Colleges That Change Lives. And it, 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 there's it's like 20 schools you've never heard of, but these schools actually have a higher percentage of getting their kids into Ivy League graduate schools than Ivy League schools do. And like something like Reed College in, in Oregon, Pass fail. Colorado College, you take one class at a time for three weeks. Now, I have the attention span of a fruit fly. So, but if I had known that in college, that I could take one class at a time for three weeks, take the exam and move on, I would have killed it. I would have killed it. But there's, there's a right school for everyone, and they're not all the same. Uh, and I know that's the case out here as well. What, uh, one of the things that we did a lot at the embassy is we worked a lot with the polytechnics and even ITE. Because if you go to the National University of Singapore, you don't, need our, you don't need our help. You're doing just fine. My issue is not the Einsteins that we know about. It's the Einsteins that we don't know about, that aren't given the opportunities, right? And what is a society we are missing? That we're not curing cancer. We're not going fast enough to Mars, all of those things. Because you cannot tell me that you have to be born into a rich family or had opportunities to go to these schools, and that's the only way we move forward as a society. That's not remotely true, and everyone in this room knows that. The question, question is, how do you find that way? Right? Maybe you go to Canada for college. Maybe you go to Australia for college. Maybe you go to Indonesia for college. But wherever you go, you are going to add to yourselves and give yourselves even more, you're gonna widen your aperture of the things you can be involved in. You're gonna make yourself smarter. You might not be in school, 
You might have teachers that just stink, but because someone sits to the left of you and your right of you, you're gonna learn something culturally, you're gonna learn something about yourself, and it's going to allow you to go further because you'll have a different set of skills than the person who's applying for that job. That's what I think. We've got time for just one last question uh, because um, uh, everybody wants to go home. Uh, it's almost toward the end of the school day here and we want, want to make sure that uh, people get their buses. But Kirk, it's, as you look at the world around us, it, it, there's a lot going on. There's always been a lot going on, but, but this particular year and last year, um, there's, there is so much um, anxiety around uh, geopolitics, things that happen, not just Ukraine, of course Ukraine, but we look at politics in the U.S. We look at politics even in Europe with Brexit and, and all over the world, it seems like there is stress and tension in our world. As students now are getting ready to either study for another year or two here or move on into the world, what do you, what do you say to them about dealing with a complex world that might seem terrifying and or depressing in some, sometimes and, and amazingly fun and interesting in others? How, how, do we, how do we face that as adults in a way that is productive? People in this room and people of your age bracket, like literally that four-year window of who's in high school now, have, are going to come out of this with either the most important skill that you need to have in the world as we're going into, which is being adaptive or you're gonna take the, long, the wrong lessons from the last couple of years, which is government can screw up, adults don't know anything, which is a lot, there's a lot of truth to that. But if you come out of this as adaptive, as you guys have done stuff online, you've had to kind of roll with it when one wave of COVID versus another, no vaccine, yes vaccine, not seeing your friends, God forbid that you've had family members who have gotten sick, if not worse, you're stronger because of it. You're stronger than our generation, for sure. But every day, you have to see the beauty in life and have to see the opportunity in life. That's up to you. If you decide you want to stay in the five block radius you grew up in, that's as far as you're ever gonna get. If you decide that you're willing to go to college at a place that no one in your family's ever heard of, or you're gonna take a job in a place far away, not, not even that far away, but a plane away, you're gonna open your world, to, your mind to a whole different world. And you're gonna put yourself in situations where they're gonna be funny, they're gonna be weird, sometimes they're gonna be um, discombobulating. But I've been in rooms with people who own planes, who open their mouths and you're like, going, oh my God, that's the dumbest person I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> like, like they just had to have like, like I, I, was at, I was at an event with Barack Obama one time. He said he had time for four questions and someone, someone got up there and the guy owned three planes. And he was serious, he was so earnest. And he said, this was when, when Barack was running. Senator, I have been trying to get your campaign to allow me to do this poetry event. I've been trying to do it for six months. And I'm sitting there like, what is going on here? <laughs> this is like four questions. This guy's about to be the leader of the free world. A poetry event. And I've been laughing about that for 12 years. <laughs> he brought me more happiness than he'll ever know. <laughs> but put yourself in those rooms. Right. I don't know if you know who Charles Barkley is, an NBA player. I once saw him dancing with Nancy Pelosi, who's the Speaker of the House. Nancy is about 80 years old, <laughs> six foot five African American guy, and a small, older white woman dancing. And I think it was to some like old hip hop. <laughs> it's burned in my brain in not a good way, <laughs> but it makes me smile. And I was like, that was the craziest thing I've ever seen. It's not always about monetary success or what. It's, it's been in weird situations, as I said to you at the start. When you're sitting here right now, you're like going, I couldn't have even imagined it. And I've got to do that. And I'm not the smartest cat in the room, probably not even the hardest working. But I like people, 
and I like new things. And that served me pretty well. And you're sitting in a room with people from different cultures. You have an advantage, so use it. And don't be afraid. And there's the bell. Ambassador Kirk Wagger, president of Wagger Global and board member here at Excel Education. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, guys. And thanks to all of you here in the room and watching online. Uh, we have many more Excel Dialogues coming up. Uh, next one will be in April, so do stay tuned for details on that. Until then, I'm Glenn Van Zutphen. Thanks so much for being with us today. Have a great day.